Revelation chapter 5, and we will begin looking at verse 1. The Bible says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Now, last time we were looking together, chapter 4 uses the word book, I'm sorry, throne, how many times? Do you remember? Twelve times in that one chapter. Well, right here, in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne, which is who? It's God the Father sitting on the throne. And the reason why we know that is because the Lamb comes in, in chapter 5, if you know anything about the book of Revelation. So the Father's on the throne, in his right hand is a book. So now keep your finger in Revelation chapter 4, and quickly turn to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17 will help us understand a little bit about what is on the side of the king that sits on the throne according to the Old Testament scriptures. Deuteronomy 17, we're going to look at verse 18. This is counsel to the king of Israel, okay? It says in verse 18, It shall be when he, the king, sits upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all his words of this law and these statutes, to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, he and his children, in the midst of Israel. Isn't that amazing? So on the side of the king, something that's supposed to be there that he's supposed to read every single day is his own handwritten copy of the law that was given to the priests, basically the Torah, okay, the first five books of Moses. Why? so that the king would not turn to the right hand or to the left. Even in Isaiah chapter 30, God says that there is a voice that will be behind you saying, if you go to the right or to the left, this is the way, walk ye in it. Okay, so going to the right or to the left is something we should not do. We should be walking the straight and narrow path according to Jesus, correct? Amen. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 5, when you see this book right next to the side of the king, you kind of get an idea from Deuteronomy 17 what this is. It happens to be a book containing the law of God. Okay? The law of God. So, interestingly, when this book is talked about further in, the book, in chapter 6, we can realize a little bit more about this law and how we can see in that law there's both the blessings and the curses. And I need to uh, show you in verse 2, no, I'm sorry, verse 1, we're going to read that again because there's another portion that I want to talk about. I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Now this book was written on both sides. Within and on the back side, okay? Go to Ezekiel chapter 2. This is something interesting that you'll find here in the scripture. Ezekiel 2. And the Bible says in verse 8, now let's go to 7. Thou shalt speak my words unto the people, the people would be the rebellious children of Israel, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. For they are most rebellious, God says. Verse 8. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat what I give you. When I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. A roll of a book. Okay, so it was rolled up. It was like a scroll that was rolled up. A, a roll of a book. Verse 10, he spread it before me. So now it's open. And in it was written within and without. Ah, so on the inside and on the back side, within and without, both sides. And there was written therein, notice what it says, lamentations and mourning and woe. 
Lamentations, mourning, and woe. Okay, so God says in this section, I want you to speak with my words. Eat what I give you. And then he hands him a scroll. Inside the scroll, when, after it's opened up, is lamentation, mourning, and woe. All right, interesting things here. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. What did the roll have in it? Lamentation, mourning, and woe. Okay? And he said, speak with my words. Eat what I give you. He gave him a roll, and it was lamentation, mourning, and woe. And he says, eat this roll and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So it's interesting to me that when he says that he's supposed to eat what he gives him, he, he's, you know, what is he going to eat? Well, lamentation, mourning, and woe. And then after he eats, he's told to go and speak with my words. Notice verse 2. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Verse 3, and he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as, or honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Do you see the correlation between my words that you're supposed to speak, the scroll that's written on both sides, he's supposed to eat that scroll and speak God's words. It was sweet in his mouth, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? And then he says, you're supposed to, not after you eat, go and speak with my words. So we see in the roll here, written on both sides, that Ezekiel was supposed to eat and uh, basically nourish himself with so he can share something. It uh, contained the lamentations, mourning, and woe of God's words. Now, context. Why was Ezekiel being spoken to by the Lord? Was it because the children of Israel were with God or had apostatized from him? They had apostatized, you see? And so, because they were contrary to God, Ezekiel was given the message to speak lamentation, mourning, and woe, which was contained in the words of God. Now, think about it for a second. The lamentations, mourning, and woe that we can find in the Old Testament are in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. I think it's Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 or 29. I don't remember, but it's lamentations, mourning, and woe if you are walking contrary to God. It's called the curses. You remember the blessings and the cursings, right, in the Old Covenant? Well, of course, if you follow the Lord, you're going to be blessed. If you walk contrary to Him, you're going to receive lamentations, mourning, and woe. And interestingly, that's what we see in Revelation chapter 6. We're currently studying chapter 5, but as that book is being revealed or unloosed, uh, separated from the, the, the uh, seals that are on it, as the seals open and the book is become, becoming more open and able to be read, that is displaying the lamentations, mourning, and woe of those that have gone apostasy, in apostasy away from God's words. So anyways, that's just a little snippet of what we're going to be talking about when we go into Revelation chapter 6. But now... Go back to chapter 5. I feel like I'm speaking really fast, and that's because there is a lot to share. Now, verse 2, Revelation chapter 5. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Okay, so why not? Well, part of the reason is because it was sealed. Okay, we, we read that there in verse 5. It says, a book written within and without, on the backside, and sealed with seven seals. Now, what's interesting about this sealing part is that we can read in... Uh, where is it now? Isaiah 29. Go to Isaiah 29, and as you're turning there, I'm going to read something to you. This is a very insightful section of uh, what's called manuscript releases. This is taken from uh, 150 or so years ago. In fact, I'll give you the date. Um, you know, I don't even have the date here. Anyways, ninth manuscript release. It says, it, talking about the book of Revelation, <clears throat> There in his open hand lay the book, the roll 
of the history of God's providences, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of earth's history unto its close. I think that's a very, very powerful way to put what's in this section. I was saying, according to Ezekiel, that it's the summation of God's words. And you can see that. The prophetic, the blessings, the curses, the lamentation, mourning, and woe for Ezekiel's people who are contrary to God's will. And so we can see that <clears throat> right here, even in Isaiah, it kind of gives you a clue as to why it was sealed. Okay, Isaiah chapter 29, verses 9 through 14. It says, Stay yourself and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and has caused your eyes, or closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers he hath covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, so, okay, they're drunk, according to verse 9, but not with wine. They don't see whether they're prophets or rulers or seers because their eyes are covered. And then it says here, it's because there's a book that is sealed, verse 11 in the middle, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, please read this, I pray thee. And he says, well, I can't read it because it's sealed, verse 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, oh, please read this, I pray thee. And he says, well, I don't know how to read. I'm not learned. Verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Ha! Huh. Mixed into that amazing section is a prophecy of Jesus. Jesus actually used that section of the scripture while he was preaching here on earth. Now, let me just sum it up real quick. People are as they are drunk, okay? They don't, you don't make good decisions if you're drunk. The Bible is pretty clear about alcohol. You should stay away from it completely. Not even sipping it once in a while with friends. That's a no-no according to the scripture. My mind is more important about making godly decisions for eternity than how I should feel as though, uh, you know, relaxed a little bit when I'm spending time with my friends. It's not that important. Alcohol should be totally abstained from. And I can show you other scriptures if you're interested. Just go to revelationwithdaniel.com and send me a contact if you're interested. I'll send you more on wine or alcohol in the scripture. So here it's saying these people are as though they're drunk. They can't make good decisions. They're prophets, they're teachers, they're rulers. They can't think. Why? Because the book is sealed. Well, they go to the people that are learned and say, read this for me. Nope, can't. Sorry, it's sealed. Hey, somebody who doesn't know anything, read this for me. Nope, sorry, it's sealed. And it says, it's because, right there in verse 14, they teach the doctrine of men for the fear of God. And Jesus actually picked this up while he was speaking to the Pharisees, which, by the way, the Pharisees were the teachers of the day. Ha! Those that were supposed to know more knew less because they trusted in them, their own words rather than the words of God. So turn now to Matthew 15. We'll just read that real quick. Matthew 15, and we'll see in verses 7 through 9, Jesus is speaking um, to the Pharisees. 7 through 9, You hypocrites, it says, as Jesus was speaking to these Pharisees that hold the tradition of the elders. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, verse 8, This people draw near me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And this is why, verse 9, In vain they worship me. They worship me for no reason. It's, it's not even useful. Because they teach for doctrines 
the commandments of men. So when we jump back to the book of Revelation, in chapter 6, we see this book that contains all the words of God, whether it be prophecy or history, blessings or cursings, in this context, rather in the context of Ezekiel, it was the curses because the people had apostatized. But right here we see this book rolled up and it's sealed. Sealed with seven seals. Seven is the word of the uh, number of completeness, right? So it's completely sealed. And nobody is around, whether it be in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, that is able to open the book, even to look on it. That's the big problem with this section. John understands that this book needs to be open and read to be understood. But nobody is able to read it. And so he looks around, he can't find anybody. And it says there in verse 4, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book or to read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse 5. One of the elders, remember last time we talked about the elders, most likely the leaders of the um, ministry of God, because there's God the Father, represented by Aaron. There's the four living creatures, represented by the four sons of Aaron. And then there's the 24 divisions, like the the sons of Aaron were supposed to have 24 divisions to do ministry in ancient Israel. Well, right here in Revelation chapter 4, you have God the Father, the four living creatures, and the 24. So one of the 24 elders leading the ministry of heaven for the, for the universe, if you will, he says, said unto John, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Okay, now, who is this? The Lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, wait a minute. 1 John chapter 5, verse 8 says, The devil is as a roaring what? Lion. Lion. Ah, so we have an impersonator there, don't we? The enemy is impersonating Jesus Christ. Absolutely he is. But this one is the true lion. The true king. The king of heaven, not the king of earth, or the prince, if you will. So the line of the tribe of Judah, we can read in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is a minister of Judah, of the new covenant, right? The new ministry, not the Levitical ministry anymore, it's the ministry of Melchizedek and that of Judah. An everlasting new ministry. And that's what uh, was very difficult to understand back during the day because if you were a Pharisee and you were keeping the law and the law was from Moses and this new guy Jesus shows up and he's changing that stuff and now he's from Judah? What? Sounds very contrary. So Jesus, or John is pointing out here that he's the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. The root, ah, oh, the root, yes, Israel, right? Because everybody says today that the root is Israel. You look at Rev, uh, Romans chapter 11, and it seems to just spell it out so plainly. In fact, let's turn there for a moment, Romans chapter 11, and we're going to see maybe something a little bit different. Romans chapter 11, and the Bible teaches in verse 15. If the casting away of the children of Israel, them, be the reconciling of the world, so because the gospel went to the Gentiles, what shall be the receiving of the children of Israel but life from the dead? A representation, of course, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump also is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And so it seems right here that the casting off of the world is Israel. I'm sorry, the casting away of them, which is Israel. And then the bringing of them, which is Israel, is back, uh, represents Israel. Then the first fruit must be Israel, and the root must be Israel. So look at verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and you, Gentile, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakes of the root of the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if you boast, listen, you bear not the root, but the root bears you, right? Well, a lot of people will look at this section and believe it's Israel, but I want to say, according to the Bible, even in the very next verse. It's not Israel, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It must be Jesus. We are not saved by becoming one of the children of Israel, even 
those that are of the bloodline. It has nothing to do with Israel anymore. I've got so much to say on that, but we're not talking about that right now. We're going to be talking about that later in chapter 7. But I just want to point out right here that in chapter 15, you, you need to look at verse 12. Chapter 15 and verse 12. The Bible says, again, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. The root of who? Jesse, the son of David, which was the son of David, Jesse. Okay, so the root of Jesse, the one whom the Gentiles will be saved by, in whom the Gentiles will trust. This is Jesus. How do I know that? Revelation 22. Go to Revelation 22, and my Bible says pretty clearly that Christ is the root or the son of Jesse. Um, let's see, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, who, by the way, his father was Jesse, and I am the bright and morning star. So now who's the root, according to the Bible? It's Jesus Christ, not Israel. But what blows your mind even further? Jesus is Israel. Amen. I've got a whole presentation on that. If you're interested, find me at revelationwithdaniel.com. But for now, we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 5. And notice it says in verse 5 again, one of the elders said, hey, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, this is Jesus, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Why did Jesus have the ability to open the seals and loose the, or I mean, open the book and loose the seals? Because he didn't have blinders on his eyes. He didn't teach for doctrine the doctrines of men. He taught the word of God in truth, in clarity, and with power. So because Jesus stuck to the words of his Father, he was able to understand so much more, he was able, even able to open the book, right? It says there in verse 6, And lo, behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now, how many times in the book of Revelation is the word lamb used? Anybody know? 29 times. 28 of those 29 times, they are referring specifically to Jesus Christ. One time in Revelation 13, the lamb-like beast is where it's not talking about Jesus Christ. Just an impersonator is all. Okay? So, we have here in verse 6, in the middle, it's a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This is so huge, we're not going to cover all the details, okay? This verse is so amazing. Now, if you can, find the book of Habakkuk, okay? They move the book of Habakkuk on me all the time, but I know it's at the end of the, it's at the, end of the Old Testament. <clears throat> so if you, can, if you can find that book... You're going to go to chapter 3, and you're going to look at verses 3 through 4. Habakkuk 3, verse 3 through 4. God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. It says in verse 4, And His brightness was as the light. He had horns. He had what? He had horns coming out of his hand, and there, coming out of his hand, the horns, was the hiding of his power. Okay? Horns coming out of his hands was where the hidden power was. So now go back over to Revelation chapter 5. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, it says there, on this lamb were seven horns. Horns can represent power. Okay? So there were seven horns coming out of this lamp. What does the number seven represent? Completeness, fullness, totality. 
The totality of power, which we could call omnipotence, was right here on this lamb. And then it says in verse 6, and seven eyes. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 18, I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm not, we're not going to go there and read it. But it says, it talks about the eyes of your understanding. Okay? The eyes of the Lord in Chronicles go to and fro, searching out the whole earth. The eyes of the Lord are what is able to see the knowledge, the ability to know what's going on. You know, like, I know what happened back there. I saw it. You know what I'm saying? You could say that, right? And that means I understand what happened. I know what he did. I saw it. Okay? Sometimes my children, they'll, they'll say, well, it was this way. And I, I saw what happened. Okay? You're caught because I saw it. The eyes of your understanding or the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking those who, who search for him. Okay? So now, if the eyes represent the ability to know, then we have seven eyes on this lamb could very well represent the omni or omniscience of God, the all-knowing. Okay, so the horns are the all-power. The eyes are the all-knowing. And then what is it? It says there in verse uh, 6 in, in the end, there's this lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. That would be everywhere. The seven spirits going into all the earth. That's omnipresence. So right here in this one verse, the Lamb of God, having been slain, was the one that could open the book and loose the seven seals. He had all power, all knowledge, the ability to be everywhere. Oh, you say, like, wait a minute. Jesus, I thought, had our body after he resurrected. He did, yes, but through his Holy Spirit. He can be everywhere. Amen. Okay? So he has omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence right here in this verse. This is probably one of the most powerful verses in all of the Bible. Okay? Right there. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. I think we are going to be understanding this more and more throughout the thesis ages of eternity. The omnipower or omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience of God in one verse. Now, so what is this idea of the seven spirits being sent forth into all the earth. Now, I have a lot in my notes. I don't have the time to share everything in my notes in one presentation, but I think I, it, it makes sense to put Revelation 5 into one presentation. So what I'm going to do is try to make this huge concept something we can look at in just a few minutes. Now, let me just open it up for a second and explain to you what's going to be done. Revelation chap, uh, chapters 1 through 21, there are 22 chapters, but 1 through 21 illustrate the seven yearly festivals of the Israel economy in chronological order. Okay? So now, in Revelation chapter 20, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 23, we can just go there real quick. We're going to see that in Leviticus 23, there are seven yearly festivals. Okay, these festivals, you're not going to find this. I'm just going to bring you here so you can make a note in it because I'm going to read kind of just portions of each verse. In verse 5, you'll, you can read this one with me. In the 14th day of the first month, at even, is the Lord's what? Passover. Okay, the Passover and unleavened bread, which is in the very next verse, verse 6, they are synonymous. You can read that in the book of Luke. I don't, I'm not going to take you there, but I think it's 23 verse 1 or 24 verse 1, 22 verse 1, somewhere around there. Even 21 verse 1, something like that. But in the 14th day is the Lord's Passover, verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we have Passover and Unleavened Bread. That's two of the feasts. Look at verse 10 toward the end. You'll be bringing the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. That's the third feast, okay, the third festival. There's Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits right there in the first, uh, the verses 5 through 9. Now, jump down to verse 16. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number 50 days. 
and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Now, 50 days, what do we call that? The Feast of Pentecost. Yep, Pentecost. So we have so far Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, or 50 days. Notice it says toward the end of verse 24, there will be a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So that's number five, trumpets, the festival of trumpets. And then in verse 27, also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. That's the sixth festival, the day of atonement. Finally, the last one in verse 34, toward the end, it'll be the feast of tabernacles for seven days. So now you can see right here in this chapter, um, Leviticus chapter 23 goes through the Passover, unleavened bed, first fruits, uh, 50 days or Pentecost, trumpets, the day of atonement, and tabernacles. The book of Revelation goes in chronological order, the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, 50 days or Pentecost, trumpets, the day of atonement, and tabernacles. Isn't that fascinating? Amen. So we're going to see that right now in just a quick overview, okay? With this, I'm not going to take all day long to study this with you guys. This is for you to study further. I'm just giving you kind of the overall beauty of it. Now, we said before, in Revelation chapter 1, it is a chapter that covers the death, burial, and resurrection more than any other chapter in all of the book of Revelation, okay? There are other references to it. Most specifically, in chapter 13, where we have the false god, or the antichrist, I'll call him, that has a deadly wound that is healed. Okay, that's a death, burial, and resurrection. It's actually an impersonation of the gospel. That's the gospel that is not God's. This one is. Revelation chapter 1. So in Revelation chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 7 says the first begotten of the dead, okay? First begotten of the dead. That's the death, burial, and resurrection. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. The blood, of course, was representing his death. That's in verse seven. In verse, or that was verse five, sorry. Verse seven says, those also which pierced him. He was pierced through the hands and the feet, right? So this, again, is referring to his death. And then it says in verse 15, his feet were like unto fine brass, as though they burned in a furnace. Remember, we talked about um, Amos chapter 9, verse 1, shows that Christ was on the altar. The altar, which was the altar of sacrifice, was bronze. And so if his feet were on the altar and his feet looked as though they were burnished bronze, there's a connection with the altar of bronze and Christ being on them or on it. He was the, the sacrifice for us. So that again is referring to his death, his burial and resurrection. And then it says in verse uh, 18, I am he that liveth, I was dead, and I am alive forevermore. Death, burial, and resurrection. You see it? Again, I am alive forevermore, he said. I have the keys of hell and of death. Hell being the grave. I have the keys of the grave and of death. So again, referring to the death. There are seven references that I found in chapter one of the death, burial, or resurrection of Christ. Seven, interestingly. So we won't look at that because we did look at that before. I'm just covering it quickly. Now, what happened is in chapter five, we, chapter four and five, we have the king in chapter four being alone on the throne. Yes or no? Yeah. When was the king alone on the throne? While Christ was on the earth? Yes or no? Yeah. Christ was on the earth in chapter 4. God the Father is on the throne. Because even Jesus said on, in the prayer, remember? When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Interestingly. So, Jesus was on the earth. The Father was in heaven. Even during the baptism in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 3, Jesus was baptized. The Father speaks from heaven, sending the, the dove, remember the Holy Ghost? The Father speaks from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So there's the Father up in heaven, the dove coming down, the Holy Spirit being light, lighted on, on Jesus, and Jesus is on the earth. So the Father's in heaven during the time that Christ was on the earth. That's chapter 4 of Revelation. Well, guess what? Jesus ascends up to heaven. When he ascends up to heaven, 
what is he going to do? He's going to begin his next stage of the priestly ministry. Okay, there is so much to cover. I'm, I'm, it's flooding my mind. This is amazing. Now, you've, you've got to understand, there are three times in the New Testament Jesus says it is done or it is finished. Okay? The first time he said it, where was it? John chapter 19 on the cross. It is finished. What is finished? The outer court section of the sanctuary containing the brazen altar and the laver of water, that section with the lamb being slain is finished. That's when Christ gives up the Holy Ghost, okay? Or gives up the ghost, not the Holy Ghost. So now Christ, after he's finished with that portion of his ministry, he goes into the holy place, which is where he's up there ministering for a long time. Okay, we're going to cover this further in the, in, the, in the future. But so as he's in the holy place, well, guess what? The Old Testament in Leviticus and Exodus, in Hebrews it refers to it, and right here in Revelation, it talks about Christ being inaugurated to begin that ministry. You see, the son, uh, or Aaron, the high priest, he wasn't able to work in the ministry of the, of the uh, sanctuary until he was anointed. Remember on the right ear, the right hand, the right big toe. He was anointed with both oil and with blood. I think it was blood and then oil. But see, he needed to be anointed with oil. Jesus did. He was already anointed with blood. I mean, there was blood running all over him when he was on the earth, right? He was a lamb in the presence of Christ, or the Father, as he had been slain, he was already anointed with blood. So now what did he need to be anointed with? Oil, Oil of course. So now, I'm going to read this real quick, and it's, I know it's going to give me a reminder of where we need to go next here. This two-chapter scene shows Christ taking his seat on the throne next to God, the Father, after being victorious on the earth. The Father was alone in chapter 4. When Christ was on the earth, he said, Our Father, which art in heaven. That's Matthew 6, verse 9, and Luke 11, verse 2. Christ also had the Father speak from heaven during his baptism. That's Matthew 3, 17. When Christ ascended as the Lamb, as it had been slain, which was the Passover Lamb, according to 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the seven spirits of God were sent forth into all the earth. Now, that's where we got to go, Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see... During Peter's most amazing sermon, he actually understood what was going on in heaven, okay? Jesus had made it clear to him through his own study of the prophecies that this is what's going on. So in verses 29 through 36, notice what Peter says. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his grave or sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, which was the son of David, remember? Son of David, have mercy on me. This being referred to Christ. So, knowing that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Verse 32. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we were all witnesses. We were standing there in Acts chapter 1, in verse 9 through 11, we saw Jesus actually ascend up into heaven. And it says there in verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, like we just read in Revelation 5, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which Jesus, by the way, had prophesied in, in John chapter 14 through 16, it says, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear, which was the flames on the tops of the heads of the disciples and the sound of the rushing mighty wind. Are you with me? Okay, so Paul, I'm sorry, Peter is preaching. That, hey, listen, David, he's dead. But David prophesied that Jesus 
was going to be dead and resurrected, and he was going to be taken up into heaven. We saw it. We saw it with our own eyes. And now that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God, and as a result of him sitting on the right hand of God, he has been able to receive the promise of the Holy Ghost, and that's why you've seen him shed it forth, that gift of the Holy Ghost, and that's what you see and hear. So Peter is actually preaching in Acts chapter 2 the identical thing that happened right there in Revelation chapter 5. And guess what day it was that Peter was preaching? What day was it? It was Pentecost. It was the Feast of Pentecost. And so what's happening is only 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, right, the wave sheaf, 50 days after the dead um, grain had been brought up, or rather the living grain was killed, brought down, and then was lifted up and waved. So we have the death, burial, and resurrection pictured there. You see in this beautiful picture, 50 days later, Peter is preaching, Christ is on the throne, he received the gift of the Holy Ghost, he sent it down, and that's why we have this going on. Ha <laughs> ha! Amazing! And so when it says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, the seven spirits which were sent forth into all the earth, Pentecost. Amazing. Turn to Psalm chapter 133. And we're going to see kind of uh, David giving somewhat of a mental picture of what it was like to have people together in unity during the time of the anointing of the priest. It says in verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So Psalm 133 says in verse 1 that there's this beautiful unity when brethren are together. Verse 2, it is like the precious ointment upon the head. It's like the anointing of somebody. But who is this? It's the anointing on the head or the ointment that ran down upon the beard. So there's quite a bit of oil that was poured, not just a little bit that kind of, you know, came down the hair. It goes down the beard. And then it says, even Aaron's beard. Who was Aaron? Aaron was a high priest, right? Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Wow, this guy really got poured on. So you pour this stuff on his head. It goes down his beard. It goes down his garments. And then it says, verse 3, it was like the dew of Hermon, the dew of the mountain, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Well, who is represented by the Mount Zion? God's people, right? That's where his temple was seated. Seated. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So this illustration in, in Psalm is like, isn't it beautiful where there's unity together? People are unified in purpose, in thought, in doctrine. And then it's, it's like the anointing of the high priest. And the oil is so much that it runs down the beard, runs down the garment. And it's like the dew that continues going down onto the mountains. And you can imagine the Holy Ghost coming down upon the disciples that were in unity on the day of Pentecost. Amen. Yes. There's more in the notes you can read in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Exodus and Leviticus, where Aaron needed to be anointed before he continued on with his ministry. And I don't think it's in your notes. Hebrews chapter 9 says that we, need, we can understand that almost all the vessels of the ministry can be, uh, needed to be anointed, okay, so that the ministry can begin. And we can see that, of course, in Exodus uh, with Ezekiel, I'm sorry, with uh, Aaron being anointed and also in Leviticus. So going back to Revelation chapter 5, we're going to see in this section here that there was a book that was on the right hand of the king. That book couldn't be read by anybody. It couldn't be opened by anybody. By the way, the book occurs, the word book occurs eight times in this chapter. So the book is now the focus. And it says in verse 6 again, let's read it. I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So that, of course, is representing not only the acceptance of the Lord. He was accepted. That's why he was given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And because of that accepting of God the Father of his Son, and then God the Father giving the Holy Spirit, the Son sent the Holy Spirit to the earth. 
That's where Peter was preaching, hey, it's the gift of the Holy Ghost that you're seeing because Jesus has ascended and is set on the right hand of the throne. So then in verse 7, He came, this is the Lamb, He took the book out of the right hand of Him that sat upon the throne. And when He had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now we can see here in verse 8, when he had taken the book, there was this amazing breakout of praise. Okay? The reason why they were praising is because when they fell down before the Lamb, because he was able to open the book. Now, what's the deal with this, opening the book and breaking the seals? We're going to learn next time when we study chapter 6 that it was a big deal for Christ to be able to open the, or break the seals and open the book. Because as those seals are broken, you can see time continues. Okay, that, I'm just going to give you a little snippet here. If Christ was unable to open the seals, time would not have continued. The enemy would have won. Christ would not have been able to go up, be accepted by the Father, and allow time to continue with the first horse, the second horse, the third horse, the fourth horse in chapter 6. He would have been beaten. The enemy would have won. The humanity would have been destroyed. I think. It just makes sense to me that that would have happened. But it's pretty clear. Had Jesus not been accepted by the Father, the seals would not have been broken because there was nobody in heaven, under heaven, under the earth, anywhere that was able to open the book or even to look on it. And so in chapter 6, you can see that when those seals are opened, that time continues. So that's why the people in heaven are praising. They have fallen down and they are praising this lamb that was slain and had been accepted because now time can continue. And humanity can be saved. Amen? Amen? So it says there in verse 7, He came and took the book from off the throne. In verse 8, when he took the book, the elders fell down with harps in their hands. And these golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. It's in chapter 8 as well that we can see the prayers of the saints being referred to in connection with the, the smoke or the incense. And let me see if I can just find that real quick. Um, it says in verse 4, The smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And so these, I, I wonder if in verse 8, this is kind of coming to me now, so bear with me. I wonder in verse 8 when these elders have these golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, I wonder if now they can actually give these to Christ who is now in position as high priest, able to intercede for, the, for humanity because he has been anointed or inaugurated. Oh, oh, by the way, Hebrews chapter 9 says that all the vessels of the ministry need to be anointed. Exodus chapter 40 says all the vessels of the ministry needed to be anointed. Moses is the one that did that. When Christ ascended up into heaven, it was not just he that was anointed. All the vessels of the ministry, including those in the most holy place, Amen. were anointed. Amen. And that's why in Hebrews 6 and 9, I think it's 6 and 9, maybe it's 6 and 10. It's been a while since I've looked at that. But that's why it says Christ went in past the veil. Not to start his ministry as he ascended, but it was because he was inaugurating the vessels of ministry so he could begin with this high priestly ministry. That's going to answer a whole lot of questions for a lot of people, I hope. So, right here in verse 9, they sung a new song. And they, they, they'd never sung this song before. Nobody had been able to. They didn't even know this song before. They sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book. Because they'd never been able to sing that song before. It says, and you're able to open the seals thereof, for you were slain, 
And you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now what's interesting about this is the 24 elders are the ones that are saying you are worthy because you can open the book and, un, and loose the seals. Here's one of the questions. Why do they, the 24 elders, wear crowns? They're not kingly crowns. They're victory crowns. There are two different crowns in the book of Revelation, kingly crowns and victory crowns. These 24 elders are wearing victory crowns, okay? So why do they wear crowns instead of kingly crowns? Victory over what? Okay, that's, that's a good question, I think, isn't it? Yeah. They sit on thrones as kings. Now, Christ, according to Revelation chapter 1, has made us kings and priests. Verse 11, I beheld and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them that were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, now this is John, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. God the Father, Son, are pictured in this chapter during the praise session of the time when Christ Jesus was able to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost from the Father as had been promised according to John chapter 14. Remember, the Bible says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you the gift of the Holy Ghost.